The other day I was preaching at a Christian unity service in an Anglican church, and as I went on I was for a moment surprised to see that the Christmas crib was still up under the high altar. But of course I shouldn't have been surprised. I remember my student days in Rome when Christmas cribs were, and I presume still are, left upright until the feast of the presentation next week, which is the real end of the Christmas season. This is something which the traditional liturgy made clear, and perhaps has been rather obscured in the new liturgy, the length of the Christmas season. Though in fact it's not so much Christmas that we continue to celebrate as the Epiphany. The Epiphany was always the more important feast in the early church. It's not so much about prolonging our devotion to the Christ child, though that of course is always something important. It's the sense of God revealing himself to the whole world in the person of the Magi, and so establishing his reign on earth. And of course, who is it who helps us to contemplate the meaning of this mystery of the Epiphany, to plumb its depths? It is, of course, Mary. We are told in Scripture that she kept all these things in her heart and pondered them. Now Mary is the mother of the church, a title which Pope Paul VI officially gave her in the 1960s. And so she helps us as the church to turn over in our minds, to meditate, not so much perhaps with our intellectual powers as with our hearts, to ruminate on the mysteries we have been celebrating, to give them time for their meaning to sink in. And once we do this, all sorts of things make sense. In last Sunday's Mass, for example, the entrance antiphon, if you followed it in the your mass sheets or in the Magnificat, those of you who take it. This is what we heard. All the earth shall bow down before you, O God, and shall sing to your name, O Most High. That is not just a general expression of praise to God. It's meant to be an echo of the worship of the kings to the newly revealed Christ. The whole earth is now the kingdom of our God, for the King has come among us, born of a woman, born of Mary. And so too it is when we continue our celebration of the Epiphany throughout this season, especially with the stories of the baptism of Jesus, with which his earthly ministry begins, and with the gospel we heard last Sunday, which St. John calls the first of Jesus' signs, the miracle of turning water into wine at the wedding feast of Cana, in which, of course, Mary plays a very special part. By calling Jesus' miracles signs, St. John wants us to see Jesus not just as a wonder worker, but as someone whose miracles have a deeper significance. Even when the physical effects of the miracles have passed away, they point to a deeper miracle that is going on. Eventually, all the wine at the wedding feast got drunk. Probably didn't take very long for that to happen. In the end, all the people that Jesus healed died as everyone does. But something deeper was happening, an even greater miracle than the physical one, a spiritual change, a conversion. And in the case of the wedding feast, of course, what is being pointed to is that Jesus himself is a bridegroom. Coming among us at Christmas and Epiphany, he came to claim his bride, 
God's new people. And Mary has a very special part to play in this miracle, the first of Jesus' signs and the one which, according to St. John, let his glory be seen. And again, there's an echo there of the epiphany in which the glory of Christ was revealed. It almost seems as if Mary gently nudges our Lord over the edge into the beginning of his public life, which he seems a bit resistant to beginning. And here perhaps she represents the bride. The bride is not supposed to uh, propose to the bridegroom, except in a leap year, but of course can, in feminine fashion, drop all sorts of hints. And as we hear the story, there seems to be an echo also of the very beginning of the Bible, where Eve has fallen into temptation herself through the serpent, and having fallen into temptation, she then leads her man, Adam, into sin too. Now traditionally, Mary is known by the church as the new Eve. That is, she is our mother in the realm of grace. Just as the first Eve is the mother of all people in the realm of nature. How fitting, therefore, that it should be Mary, the new Eve, who prompts the new Adam, Jesus, the bridegroom of humanity, into beginning that work by which he undoes the effects of sin, redeems us from the first Adam's sins and saves us from its effects, the effects of what we call original sin that we are all born into. And in this, Mary wonderfully expresses in our name the longing that we all have, even if we cannot put it into words, even if we are not explicitly members of the church, there is still a longing in every human heart that the bridegroom should come and make all things new. If we go back even further to the Advent liturgy, we heard a phrase there from the minor prophet Haggai, where Jesus the Messiah is referred to as the desire of all nations, the one desired by all the nations. Mary puts this desire of the earth into effect in a most ardent fashion. When the Annunciation occurs and she says, let it be done to me as you have said to the angel, this doesn't mean, as we sometimes perhaps feel it does, oh, well, okay, if you insist, I, I'd better say yes. Rather, what it means is, oh, yes, by all means. If you wish it, so do I with all my heart. Bring it on, as people say nowadays. If you and I do God's will reluctantly, brothers and sisters, he is gracious enough to accept it, but he would far prefer us to desire his will with all our hearts, as Mary did. She is our teacher. She is our mother in this as in everything. And what a compassionate what a tactful and discreet mother she is. How often we find ourselves in the same position as that unfortunate couple at the wedding feast. We run out, not of wine, we run out of even more important things. We run out of love. No more love in our hearts, we're just left to our own bitterness and resentment. We 
We run out of faith. We find it failing in the difficulties of life. We are short on hope for ourselves, our families, our children, our grandchildren, and indeed for our world. But the worst of it all is that we haven't even got the gumption to take stock when this happens and deliberately face God and tell him about it and ask for his help. We just sink often enough into a kind of black hole. And it's at times like this that we may have this extraordinary grace given to us to realize that Mary has noticed. She has seen that we have run out. And she's still there at Jesus' side, drawing his attention to our plight. And this gives us a very concrete experience of those words that can remain rather abstract, sin and salvation. All that the church teaches us about being in need of a savior, the reality of sin and salvation, these things can be rather on the theoretical level, but suddenly at moments like this, they become real. And it all highlights for us the supreme importance of prayer addressed to Mary, and especially the rosary. Particularly when we find ourselves in any experience of darkness, whether in our own lives or in the world, or if we feel somehow in the grip of an evil that is too strong for us, as sometimes we do, it can be humiliating to turn to the rosary. It seems like a prayer for children, or rather primitive sort of people, all that repetition and counting prayers on beads or fingers. It's humbling to have to go back to our mother's knee and ask her to do something for us that we cannot do for ourselves. But that, of course, is precisely the point. Jesus told us we must be children, even to enter his kingdom, let alone to make any progress in it. This is a good illustration of what he means. Through the rosary and other prayers to Mary, we come to share in the humility of Mary herself, that utter emptiness, combined with a complete availability to God and a consuming desire to be the instrument of his will, which is the secret of her spiritual power. As the church, that is, as the children of Mary, the mother of the church, and as the bride whom Christ came to redeem and claim for his own, we thus come to realize the awesome power of the Savior we have been given. For Mary always points us to her son and says to us, as she said to the servants at the wedding feast, do whatever he tells you. We have, if only we could bring ourselves to trust him, a savior who is all powerful, whatever our need may be, a savior able to heal every disease of body, mind, and spirit, able to deliver us from every possible evil, able to right every injustice in the world and bring peace to every situation in our own families. But one who is also born of a woman, as St. Paul tells us, as we all have been, that is one who shares in our human weakness and limitation, though without sin. That woman is Mary, Our Lady. And Jesus has given her to us, as the traditional prayer for England says, so that we might hope still more. And we can add, believe still more. 
love still more.